Hey everyone, happy Sunday or whatever day it is, whenever and wherever you are in the world. I hope that you are having a good weekend or that you had a good weekend. And I've got a great topic to discuss today on our Sunday musings. But before I do, I just want to acknowledge this t-shirt that I'm wearing right now. I've worn it on and off in videos for the last couple of months on this channel. And some of you have been asking questions. Who is the dude? Who is the dog? Who's the furry? What does it say on the t-shirt? So let me explain. I have already explained it once on this channel. So if you've heard it before, I do apologize. I'm going to try and keep this explanation as short as I possibly can. The character in the t-shirt right here is Dogbomb. Dogbomb is a fursuit performer and in the real world, he works in the veterinary industry. He also happens to have ALS fairly advanced ALS these days, but continues to go to work nonetheless, doing great work in the veterinary field. He's a really inspirational guy and he's someone that's really good to look up to because he's not giving up no matter how bleak the future looks. He's not taking it lying down. He's getting up, he's fighting every day and he's a real inspiration to me. This t-shirt is to raise funds for ALS research in his honor. So when you buy the t-shirt, you help raise funds for ALS research. And in the last year, a group that I happen to be part of here in Portland, Oregon, the League of Extraordinary Floofs. We are a freelance mascot group. We go into children's hospitals once a month. We help raise money for local animal shelters, no kill animal shelters. And in the last year, we also help raise money for dystonia research as well as ALS research by taking part in the ALS walk. So I'm very proud to wear this t-shirt. I hope that you can now understand the significance of the t-shirt and the words on the t-shirt say, ALS can kiss my fuzzy butt, which honestly is how I feel about ALS too. All right, let's get on with the topic of today's video. I want to discuss how we deal with the carbon footprint of the things that we consume on a daily basis, not in terms of the footprint to generate or build or grow these things, but the footprint associated with transporting them around the world. In the last hundred years or so, it's become stupidly easy to transport goods around the world, either by airplane, if you need them in a hurry, by ship, by rail, or by road. And so we've got used to having fruit and vegetables, for example, that are out of season in our home country, but happen to be in season somewhere else in the world. And we've got used to paying to ship those fruit and vegetables to us, regardless of the carbon footprint. But in the future, as we lower the carbon footprint of our own personal transportation and our own homes, hopefully we'll continue to lower that. We also need to turn our attention to goods that are made in other parts of the world and shipped to us or fruit and vegetables or meat or whatever else we happen to consume that comes from a different part of the world. Now, it's generally accepted now that if you switch to a vegetarian or a vegan lifestyle, you can significantly cut your carbon footprint because meat farming is generally pretty intensive and it also has a fairly high carbon footprint because it's quite a wasteful process. Even if we ignore that though, we're still shipping fruit and vegetables around the world that we maybe shouldn't be. So my question to you is how would you propose we change that in the future? Because it's not really going to fly if you say to people, okay, you can't have this fruit and vegetables because they're out of season in your home country. Sorry, you can't have them anymore. That's not going to be acceptable to people who've grown up with the idea of being able to consume whatever they want that happens to come from a different part of the world. So then we have to think about low carbon transportation solutions. Well, there are electric planes being developed, but most of them are passenger planes. They're not big enough really for cargo duties yet, and they also have short range. Boats, ships, we are talking about hybrid and battery electric ones coming online in the next decade, and they will certainly help lower the footprint of the goods and, uh, goods and products that we want to ship around the world. But also trains, and road transit are another great big way of changing our carbon footprint. Now in Europe, there is a very good train network. Certainly in mainland Europe, a lot of it is electric. And so transporting things using the rail network seems to make sense. Here in America, it's not so much of an easy matter because the rail network in the United States is pretty terrible. It is fairly unreliable because it's not kept, uh, it's not in a very well kept state. And also a lot of the train lines are not electrified. So you end up resulting, resorting, sorry, to 
uh, diesel hybrid trains that travel along the tracks and are terrible emitters of all kinds of things into the atmosphere. Of course, we could look at Tesla semis. Uh, they are fully electric. Also, Nikola is bringing out some electric trucks as well as their hydrogen fuel cell trucks, which Nikola is saying will be zero emission because the hydrogen that they will offer to their customers to refuel the trucks will be generated via electrolysis of water using renewable electricity at each of its refueling sites. Whether that will happen or not remains to be seen, but it's still certainly a lower overall carbon footprint than, say, an internal combustion engine truck. But I want to know what you'd like to see in the future. Would you like to see a carbon tax being levied on products that have had to come from a long way away? Would you like to see, and, and, bear, and obviously bear with me because these carbon taxes will be levied on us, the consumers. They won't be levied on the producers, maybe. They might, they might be paid by us, the consumers, because at the end of the day, we're the ones who have to pay the prices for things. So tell me if you think that will work or not. Or maybe you'd like to see money invested into Hyperloop. We don't know if Hyperloop is going to be cost effective or reliable yet because most of the tests that we've seen are small scale tests or scale model tests. We need to see large scale tests to see what the cost effectiveness and reliability of that transit solution is going to be looking forwards. I'd love to see what you think in the comments below. Maybe another solution that you might have is to grow more fruit and vegetables locally using hydroponics. Leave me your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. I'll be back soon with more goodness here on the Transport Evolved channel. In the meantime, I hope whatever you're doing for the rest of the day is enjoyable and I'll see you soon. Keep evolving.